I'm talking primarily about Douglas Harding. And I know some of you know about him because I've been talking to you. Uh, but some of you probably won't know uh, much about him. Um, as you see, to understand these things, you definitely have to have a grey beard. It seems to be part of the requirement. Right, Douglas Harding, I'd like to tell you about his background, but I haven't really got time because, um, uh, you know, this is a whistle-stop tour, really. Um, but I've, I've got his um, biography. It's a graphical biography. I encourage you to have a look. It's a beautifully written book. Uh, and I've also got copies of the slides. There's 30 of them here. For those of you that are interested, you can take it away. But there will be copies available anyway, subsequently. And there's a longer paper, a proper referenced paper, um, to support it as well. So, so there's Douglas Harding. Um, for Douglas Harding, his journey that we're going to talk about began when he saw this picture in the book. Look at the left-hand one. Uh, the the right-hand one I've got there for another reason I'm not going to go into. This is the picture that he saw in a book. And he looked at that, and he looked at himself, and he realized that he had no head. And, and, and that's something that the rest of his life was changed from that moment on. Because he spent the rest of his life, until he was 97, explaining to people that they didn't have a head. Okay? That you'd been, you'd, been re, you'd been incorrectly programmed all your life. Everybody else has got heads, but you haven't. Because that's, the phenomenological experience is that. I mean, if you just do it for yourself now, look at yourself. You, you start down there and you come up. There's no good, there's no good you trusting me. You have to do this. This is an injunction, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Merleau-Ponty, interestingly, said the same thing. He'd had this experience. In fact, that picture was by Mack, Ernst Mack, the, the physicist, that picture that um, Douglas Harding saw. And he wrote something very similar about seeing something in, in those same terms. So this is a kind of, it's not just Douglas Hart, it's not the madman Douglas Harding, Harding who's saying this. Now, in all, Douglas Harding tried to explain this to people, and, and undoubtedly they thought he was mad. Um, and therefore, um, he tried to think of some way better to explain it, and he developed a series of experiments uh, realizing that you can't just explain this. You have to take people by the hand and show them. I'll leave the Maturan and Varela aphorism as much as I love it, because there isn't time. Okay. Now, you, you got to... We're going to do this now, oh, together. <laughs> now, you, you don't have to, of course, but you won't understand what I'm talking about unless you actually follow this through. Don't necessarily look. This is an aid memoir for me. You just do what I tell you to do, okay? You will look at your finger, which is the great instrument we employ here, and look at what, at what your finger is pointing at. Start off by pointing at the ceiling. Now, you will see the finger is a thing, and it's pointing at another thing. It may be a light fitting, but it may be a piece of plaster work as we've got up here. So thing pointing at another thing. Bring your finger down, point to the wall. It's still the same, thing to thing, isn't it? Now turn your finger round and point to the floor. You'll see again thing indicating a thing, a coloured finger pointing at a coloured floor. Now point to your lap. Same story. You can see again it's a thing to a thing. Now point to what's above your chest. Point to what you are looking out of. What is your finger pointing at now on present evidence? When you drop your imagination, drop conditioning, Dare to be your own authority. 
and look at what you're coming out from. What is your finger pointing at? Is it pointing at an object? A solid, small, limited thing for relating to those other things out there? Or is it pointing to room for those things out there? Is it pointing at capacity? Keep your finger in position now, would you? And keep looking at your finger, but primarily look at what your finger's pointing at. Isn't what it's pointing at boundless, going on and on forever? Isn't what it's pointing at totally transparent and speckless? Isn't this speckless, boundless capacity in receipt of the scene, of the room, of the wall, and what you were looking at? Because it's empty of the scene, isn't it absolutely united with the scene? Isn't it awake? Isn't it alive to itself? Will you find awakeness anywhere in the world but here? Isn't this where awareness or awakeness or I amness belongs? Now, in that first, it breaks into two halves, clearly. In, in the first half, we're looking at a series of distinctions of the same type. But the, what Harding sets it up, um, they're categories of things, this thing, that thing, that thing. The pointing is a visual representation of injunction calling for a distinction to be made. Each indication is based on a distinction that does not take us out of this category. Successive distinctions are descriptions and applications of the law of calling. Now, in the second half of it, here phenomenologically, something different is happening. I tell you, when I first did this, I thought, I thought he was mad, as you probably think I'm mad, but something happens eventually. This, this works away when you're not, you know, over the years, and it gets, it's like a virus that kind of infects you, I tell you. Um, um, and most people start ruminating about what this means, but that ruminating gets in the way, in the same way as it does if you're meditating. For our purpose, the pointing figure can perhaps be viewed, be viewed as an injunction to distinguish what is bit distinguish that which is distinguishing. This is not now a distinction as a description, but as what Barkin calls as a creative act. Spencer Brown also speaking phenomenologically says, an observer since he distinguishes the space he occupies is also the mark, which what you were saying earlier. It should not be a surprise that, that the law of crossing is harding experience and that leads us to emptiness. Uh, Baker, if you remember this, makes a similar point with regard to Buddhist meditation. Note that Harding, like Spencer Brown, is aware of the need for injunctive language. They are both leading us to experience something. Now there is, a, I'm not going to do this, there's another experiment, which is actually my favourite one. Uh, it's a bit more difficult to organise in a group, but it's great fun to organise afterwards. If you can improvise some tubes and you look down it, and it, just looking at the pictures, you can see it easily, easily distinguishes the third person view of the experiment and the first person view of the experiment. And this was the big thing with Douglas Harding, because he was talking about a first person experience and, and just validating that first person experience as being quite different, radically, revolutionarily different from our normal third person view of the world. And that, that comes out when you do it, when you get into a tube with somebody. It's very exciting. We'll have a pop-up project later, maybe. And so that's... Um, in fact, uh, he, Harding wrote a whole book on first person, what he called the first person science versus third person science. It's a fascinating little book he wrote. So he says, in the first person reality, reality is continuously unfolding. One moment I entertain the galaxies, the next a dust grain, which sound, is very reminiscent of Blake, if any of you remember. Yeah. Um, Harding compares this with the third person view of what he calls the view in. The view in is constant and of practical value only. <laughs> 
the third person view in the third person view we are largely nominative people utilizing invariance that the category of being people implies in the first person view I'm radically different from others and according to Harding I'm looking out of an invariant emptiness there is now an emptiness frame of reference into which everything unfolds as a metaphor consider an invariant pristine screen in a movie show the image playing on the movie playing out someone's life in this movie and of course the, an essential part of that movie is the blankness of the screen the emptiness of the screen and similarly in a musical situation a sound situation music has to be played in silence now there isn't silence when the music's playing but the silence in which the music plays is a vital part of that music that's just a metaphor now we've got the Necker cube wasn't that this is a good I don't have to go into the Necker cube because we've done it already <laughs> it's great so what are my, my kind of conceit now and I, this is very speculative is that these two states that Harding's talking about are actually gestalts, gestalt images. You know the, the concept of the Necker cube. That talking very loosely, it's one ontology and two epistemologies. There's, there's one th thing which is there, but there's two ways of experience in two stable, different stable states. And so these ways of looking at the world you can make a transition between one and the other and the pointing finger is the injunction to make that transition and I think of them as being like two alternative eigenstates and perhaps not an some of these gestalt images are not equistable you look at them and everyone sees the same thing but, you've, but sometimes something just happens and you see the alternative with the naked cube most people see that face as the front face rather than that face being the front face but anyway I don't know maybe I'm wrong perhaps it's left and right handed people who knows um, that's a little kind of thing to help you see the, the two of them but they're not necessarily equistable and you require something to make the transition and as I say there it might be effort it might be energy luck play grace whatever to make that transition that excitation if you like from one eigenstate to another so that's what Douglas Harding is providing junction to carry out his experiments to make the transitions from one eigenstate of reality our everyday way of seeing to the no thing headless emptiness eigenstate of being now how does this, I'm here as a Buddhist in a sense um, so uh, both Harding and <coughs> Spencer Brown were considerably influenced by Buddhism um, Harding's most famous book on having no head is subtitled Zen and the Rediscovery of the Obvious and these books are peppered with um, Zen quotes and if you, you met him um, I met him usually in a Buddhist con I knew him uh, for a while uh, and he um, in a Buddhist context and therefore he talked Buddhism all the time I'm sure if he went to a Christian or a Sufi he'd have been equally at home so he's extremely well read and he'd have just co uh, converted like a chameleon into something else but as far as I know he was, uh, he, he was well versed in Buddhism and quoted the, the Chan Zen masters but what I, so as far as I know he didn't discover another school of Buddhism which I think has something to offer here which is the Huayen school or in Japan the Kigon school and this I'm sorry these, these slides are so busy they're ridiculous but you don't have to look at these words what I want you to do is have a look at the diagram and this is uh, Song Mi, uh, who was the fifth, fifth patriarch of Huayang Buddhism, also a Zen master. And, and this is early 9th century. 
um, he came up with this diagram that's called the four Dharma Dhatus. In other words, the four ways of appreciating reality. Uh, and it uses terminology Li and Shi, which had been borrowed from Taoism. And you can see from the black and white the influence of Taoism in the diagrams. The left hand side is emptiness. The, the empty circle is the void. On the right hand side is our world of things, distinctions. I've, I've used the word distinctions, not he didn't, but. So, and that's the she. Now, up here is the, if you like, the Douglas Harding view of things, because this is seeing the she from the emptiness. So it's the emptiness into which all of this is appreciated. The fourth one is difficult, um, because this is actually the unique contribution of Huayen Buddhism, and this is the interpenetration of all parts of the universe with every other part. Now, if, just coming back to this, this idea that instead of me being in the universe, the universe is in me, effectively. Um, it, it, uh, I mean, the immediate objection raised to that is that solipsistic. But if you talk to Douglas Harding, he, that wasn't his take on it at all, because he believed in love and um, compassion, empathy with people. And he, as he saw it, all these, all you, are in my space, but I also appreciate that you've got your space. You, you've got your own universe. In other words, there's a second order of me appreciating that you, my empathy, makes me appreciate that you have your space, and you, in your turn, can appreciate the whole universe. So, if, so I see you, you see me, and you, then you, you, your empathy does the same. So we get this multi, this fractal, this fractal-based sort of picture of things. In fact, the, um, the Huayen Buddhists use the, um, uh, the metaphor of the Indra's net, which some of you may have come across. It's in the Avantasaka Sutra, uh, which is that the, there's a... In, in the, the, the great god Indra, the Vedic god Indra, in his palace has this infinite net. And at each node of the net, there's a multifaceted jewel. And if you look at one of those jewels, you see all the other jewels reflected in it. But not only that, in those reflections, you see all the other reflections. So there's an infinite depth of reflections and an infinite number of jewels. And so I, I also use here the idea of a hologram because with a ho without going into details, without a hologram, with a hologram, um, every point uh, on, the, on the object you're photographing with a hologram is reflected at, at every, each point is reflected in every point on the hologram. Hence you get the property that if you break a hologram in two, shine a laser through it, you get the whole image and not half the image. So it's a kind of the same. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Anyway. Right. Now the other thing that um, I wanted to say was that I've been experimenting a bit with just incorporating this back into conventional Buddhism. Two minutes to go. If I start gabbling, you'll know why. Um, in, in Buddhism, um, the, the most common sort of meditation is anapanasati, which is awareness of your own breath. You breathe in and out. Now, the thing about the breath, I think, is that the breath itself is a gestalt, in gestalt psychology terms. It is a whole, which is made up of many components, of which you can use your awareness to look at the different components. And if you now concentrate on your breath, but use the, the, hug, the Douglas Harding injunction, as well as concentrating on your breath, which is just as you do it, is continually using the law of calling. But now you actually bring your awareness to that which is 
being aware of the breath. Anyway, try it out and see. <laughs> I've been experimenting it a bit. Uh, I, I'm very nearly there, so bear with me. Um, uh, there's not much here. That, that's the most important thing. Uh, I, uh, the, the most important conclusion, really, I don't know whether it, on it's this slide or another one. Um, yes, it's this, this first one here, I think, is the most important thing. Um, <coughs> there's this one here. The, um, the idea that both Douglas Harding and George Spencer Brown, for them, emptiness was a reality. They, it was this kind of thing that they kind of dealt with all the time. It was, and it isn't for most people. And my contention is that um, there's a job to be done to actually encourage people to appreciate emptiness through the, the things like Douglas Harding, through the work of <coughs> George Spencer Brown, which this conference is part. And there is this thing called the Sholan Trust, which carry, is carrying on the work of Douglas Harding. OK, I will stop there, I think. And we can answer questions if you wish. <laughs> Yes, yeah. Brings to mind something that several people have raised here, which is the, the, the uh, notion of an enfolding, which David Bohm. Yes, has. yes, implica order. Um, yes. In simple terms, maybe William Blake's the city, world of yeah. the yes. a, a very precise way of accounting for how something which appears to be distinct and individuated can at the same time be Disp conceived of as continuous uh, yes. with, with everything. Is, is, is enfolding more or less? I think so, yes. Yeah. Yes, 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 yeah. Yes, indeed. I just like to ask how you see this relating to the creation of the previous uh, <laughs> um, I think you need to get the two of us together, perhaps talking, then you <laughs> and listening, because I, 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 I suspect we're both coming from the same source. And I think the differences in these things are usually language differences. Um, but I, I mean, I find that, found that previous one very, I, a lot of it I didn't understand. Uh, but the bits I did understand, I found very inspiring. I mean, it's not something I'd come across before. So, uh, and I think you will find this in many religions um, if, if you kind of dig down into them. I mean, Sufism in particular, I think. Questions in the back here. Hi. Um, one of the things that occurs to me with the similarities and the kind of oscillations that you notice between Harding and Spencer Brown is almost a Heideggerian idea of there being a distinction between uh, things that are ready to hand and present to hand. I don't know if you know this distinction of his, where he'll say, like, you know, we all. Uh, recognize that the floor is below us, but until someone mentions it, you yes, really yeah. have present to hand the idea of the floor being there for you. The yes. that you sort of stop and think about it, then it's absolute centrality to our being here without falling down to the ground somehow matters intensely for us. Yes, so exactly. It occurs to me that there's this, to say that I have no head is to sort of say I'm stuck in Zuhandenheit rather than Bohrhandenheit. <laughs> I, I, I can't possibly see the other side, but what constitutes a kind of everyday life experience is this constant oscillation between those modes. That the objects show us their surface, and then they retreat into their complexity and their depth, and so on. Indeed. But I wondered if there's, and Dirk could probably speak, speak more to this because I know he's written on Heidegger and Spencer Brown, but um, the idea that Spencer Brown introduces, though, is that between those oscillations, there's a temporality that emerges somehow. And I'm wondering if you uh, have anything to say about how time factors into the, co the correlations between Harding's and Spencer Brown's reflections on these two modes, which could just sort of be sort of eternal modes unless you 
necessarily. It's yes, yeah. God asks us to think of them as temporal. That's a that's a simple question. <laughs> um, Certainly for Douglas Harding, there was a continual switching between these, the two modes. He was well aware um, uh, of that, that, you know, you, we talk in a day-to-day -day way, and then just by an act of, of practice, really, just by that sing, an a, a, by making the transition, we're then oscillating back. So you're continually moving backwards and forwards between the, 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 the two states. And, and that's as it should be. I've actually, I'm, I, as a sort of something just out of interest, I've re recently started um, learning the piano. Okay, this is new to me. I, I've never learned the piano before, so I've, I'm only a few months into it. But I can do it in both states. And there's, a, there's a quite a difference. I, I play the piano better in the headless state than not. So that's a kind of little clue, I think. That yes, something. Piano players play without a head. Indeed, yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Perhaps it's the same as being in the zone. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Uh, quick question. Could you go back to the diagram with the four circles? Yeah. This one? Should it be she and she or she and Lee? No, it should be she and she. Uh, Lee and she is the top one because it's actually the, it's the, it's the distinctions unfolding in the emptiness, the top one. The bottom one is, is, as I say, it's the hardest one to understand and I don't think it can, it's, it's beyond, um, it's a non-dual uh, description really because it's 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 everything in the universe interacting with everything else it's the interpenetration of every part of the universe with every other part so no, that is correct and surprising and takes a bit of pondering I'm still pondering that's for sure All right, very good. Thank okay you. thank you